today's uh, distinguished outside speaker, uh, John Long, who will give today's Beacon uh, seminar. He's the chair of the Department of Biology at Vassar College. He also holds a joint appointment in the Cognitive Science program there. And he's also director of the Interdisciplinary Robotics Research Lab at Vassar. Uh, he's interested in the function and evolution of animals, of those research combines approaches in biomedics, biomechanics, and biorobotics, which is a perfect fit for Beacon. Uh, he's the author of numerous technical papers, and I've read many of them myself, but I became, his work, became aware of his work a while back. And uh, he's the author of the 2012 book, Darwin's Devices, where evolving robots can tell us about the history of life and the future of technology. His talk today is titled, how do you say it, Robot Revolution? Right. Yeah. Biomimetics, Biomechanics, and Behavior Drive and Engineering for Robotics for Research. Thanks, Tom. Hello, Beacon, and I'm looking at monitors over there. Um, I've been really impressed over these past two days to get to know those of you in the program and understand just exactly how many different things that you do. Um, I said yesterday before I spoke to EEBB that it was a little intimidating to have this many people doing this kind of stuff, and after yesterday's talk, I want to tell you that I've altered, spent up, you know, was up late last night cranking some data, trying to address some of the things that came up in the EEBB talk yesterday. Now, I know not everybody was there, so there's going to be some redundancy for those people who were there, and then I'll try to address particularly the things that came up regarding genetic drift and some of the chance effects in our evolutionary robotic system. So I just want to let you know about that, that that's coming. What I want to talk to you about today are really um, two robotic systems that we've built, both of them in an attempt to do the kind of experimental evolution that's the hallmark of what you do here with evolution in action. But I wanted to start by talking about um, just a little background for me conceptually. Uh, at trained as a biologist, I get a lot of questions like, what in the world are you doing as a biologist studying robots? How do you get there? And there have been a couple of books that have been really influential for me that I wanted to tell you about if they're not on your radar screen. And the first is by um, Pfeiffer and Shire. It's called um, understanding Intelligence, and this was a 1999 book, but it's a fantastic book looking at intelligence as an embodied phenomenon. All right, so it really extends, gets out of this neurocentric view that intelligence is just something that happens in the brain. Right, intelligence is something that's enacted. Um, and then there's a book, a 2000 book by uh, Stefano Dolfi and Dario Floriano um, called Evolutionary Robotics, and. Uh, these folks are cox scientists, and they're really into this idea of using genetic algorithms and things like that to, to, in particular in this book, evolve controllers, neural networks, that can change the behavior of organisms. And then there's another book, and really I've been more influenced by her papers, but um, I was showing you books, so I felt like I had to be complete that way. Bio, Biorobotics by Barbara Webb, and she's got a co-author here, Thomas uh, Conti. And the biorobotics is built for biologists who are trying to use robots to study or, and test hypotheses about animals. So you put all these things together and you get something close to what um, I like to call, and we all have to come up with branding, right? So here's a sort of branding of body, evolutionary biorobotics. And, um, and the embodied part here, I know this is the land of digital uh, evolution, and so I apologize for having a body. Can I just say that in front? Okay, I'm sorry I can't be a simulated uh, avatar, uh, avatar here for you. Um, so embodied evolutionary biorobotics. And I want to do something that I did yesterday, so apologies here, but I, I find it really important. I want to talk about biorobots as a special kind of model simulation. And what Barbara Webb has done for us is to identify seven different dimensions of um, ways to think about how you might classify any particular model. So biological relevance, the substrate of the model, behavioral match, and so forth down here, completeness and abstractness. And uh, this comes from uh, two of her papers, and I highly recommend her 2001 paper. And so for her, the prerequisites for any bio-robot is that they have to be physically embodied, and that the robot tests a hypothesis. Okay, so this is, people use biorobots in many different kinds of ways. This is the Webian biorobot world in which I operate. Okay, so in addition, things that we try to pay attention to in our models 
are the behavioral match, does the robot behave like the target system? Sometimes it's hard to know if you don't have the target system around, like it's extinct, right? Um, so that's really handy, so it can hide your ignorance when you actually can't test your ideas. <laughs> uh, uh, mechanistic accuracy, which as a biologist, I like to think about as physiology, right? Physiology is the study of function. And then the structural accuracy, the, the, the fact that the robot represents um, anatomy here. And so these models, and I've got completeness and abstractness grayed out here because um, completeness is sort of how many areas of the model cover the target. And we really simplify our models. Rather than trying to be complete, we try to go for the simplest models that explain behavior that we're interested in. And then in terms of abstractness, or sometimes I call this concreteness if I'm talking about it, just the level at which you're operating. We try to operate at a very concrete level um, by finding the operating principles and making them work. So these are all trade-offs. And any modeler argues Barbara Webb should just tell you what she's trying to do. And then you judge that model based on what the goals are of the model. So we're trying to, that's why I'm telling you, we care about these five things that are up top here, is how we judge our models. All right, so the general framework that I'm operating in as a biologist is to try to understand, oh, just a little question, the origin of vertebrates. Um, and so I've met a number of you who work on invertebrates, and I always feel a little apologetic because I know there's this vertebrate-centric world. It's like. I've learned also from some of you, you know, those of you who were formerly primatologists, it's like, can I get out of primatology? Because it's like its own world that uh, there's nothing more important than studying primates, right? And then vertebrates have some of the same problems. I have an incoming call from Ivy Stanford. Is that yours or mine? That's we don't know what that is. Is that Texas calling? No, that's no. University of Idaho. Idaho's calling. Trying to call. Okay. But they're supposed to call the bridge, not us. <laughs> okay. So, um, in, in terms of the origin of vertebrates, I admit to being vertebrate centric. I find it very interesting to think about the basic body plan evolution that happened over 500 million years ago. And it is tied to this thing, right? This vertebrate head is thought to be an essential piece of the equipment that we have evolved as vertebrates. Tripartite um, nervous system that reflects paired nose, paired eyes, paired ears, and a locomotor system to go along and push that sensory platform through the world. So vertebrates are, for many of us, very interesting. Not everybody loves fish. I love fish, right? And so the, but the fact that the first vertebrates are fish, it's like, that's totally cool. Look at these crazy things that you don't see anything like these days um, here. These are mostly jawless fish here. And so we're going to be talking about uh, critters that rep represent some of these jawless fishes, and actually, we can also try to first model what we think a hypothetical ancestor for all vertebrates might have looked like. Okay, so thinking about the ancestral vertebrate for a moment, um, there are different ways that people, when you can't go back into the fossil record and reanimate that ancestor, try to model that that uh, what it might have been. So there's a big group out that's been studying uh, branchiostoma, which. Um, has a common name that I'm now forgetting. What do we call branchiostoma? Anyone remember? It's the amphioxus. That's it, it's amphioxus, um, which is a common name for this. These are little lancelets. These are chordates, so they have a notochord and a muscular tail, but they're not vertebrates. Okay, they're thought, if you look at them developmentally, the notochord goes all the way out here to the anterior most part of the rostrum. Okay, so some people, the Hollands, if you know their work in molecular biology, they're really big in using amphioxus or branchiostoma, saying, look, this, this critter has lots of ancestral characteristics. We can treat it as if it were the common ancestor for all uh, vertebrates. The problem is, right, anytime you take a terminal taxon and you treat it as an ancestral case, you're ignoring the fact that it's a mosaic of ancestral and derived features, right? So you have to be very careful when you do that. So you can also go to the fossil record. So here's a um, a cartoon of a 500 million year old fossil from China called Hycoichthys, and it's got a muscular tail with a notochord. It's not that much different in size than Branchiostoma. These are maybe a centimeter long. And so we say, okay, well, look at the fossils. We've got these great imprints. We have soft tissue imprints. What can we learn from them? Well, we can learn something about the origin of character states 
from the fossil record. Right? What comes first? We can't learn anything about process. So up here is, I guess, I think uh, somebody needs to mute their mic over there. Hi there. Okay, so, and then we have, here's another living taxon, and this was a favorite of a famous early developmental biologist named Garstang, um, who wrote, he's actually best known for his poetry about uh, larval forms. It's, you know, it's still in print. You should, if you like, if you're as cool as, or if you're as nerdy as your favorite scientist, go get the poetry by Garstang. It's really cool stuff. And one of the things he writes about is the fact that we can look at some of these larval forms. This is a larval form of a kind of critter, a cordy, called a sea squirt. And it has many features as a larva that we see in adult vertebrates. Right? And these guys, I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a second. But here's a muscular tail with a notochord, and here's its head. So that's shared by all these. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and use this model of the sea squirt here as our living analog of something like the common ancestor, okay, with the caveats that I gave you. Now, the really cool thing about the, the uh, larva of sea squirts is we know, thanks to Matt McHenry at University of California, Irvine, we know a fair amount about how they behave. And so, this little thing that looks like a peace sign here, like a peace sign myth, is actually an adult sea squirt. And it is a sessile organism. It's on, hanging out on a rocky substrate in the ocean. And it kind of looks like a sponge. It's got an in-current and an ex-current siphon, so it's pulling water in, it's filter feeding. And there's nothing in it that would make you think that this thing is actually a chordate with a notochord, right? One of these continuous uh, backbones down its back. That's because it doesn't have one. It's a sessile organism. But what it does is it spits out its larvae, and its larvae are those things up top. They have a notochord. And they swim, and what they do is they swim up towards the light. So they spend about 12 hours swimming towards the light. They get carried by ambient flow, and then they turn around and they go from being positively phototactic to negatively phototactic. They make that switch about 12 hours. They swim down onto the surface, they resorb their notochord, and they become an ugly bag of mostly water. Okay, it's the final resting state for all of you once you get a job and buy a house. Okay? You see evidence around you okay, of, of all this. So um, this is what's happening with these guys. And what Matt has done is he studied uh, their locomotion and their sensory biology. So we have a sense of how these critters work. And what's really interesting about them is these larvae are built only to swim. They're not feeding. So they're a stripped down life stage of vertebrates. They're not interested in doing anything other than getting the keys from mom and dad, stealing the car, and running away. Right? And so it's this dispersion, this dispersal here, um, is what this life stage is built for. And so what Garstang um, and other sims have, have suggested, and there's some molecular data to support the idea that these guys are actually the outgroup um, to the other chordates here, is that all you need to do is make a larva like this that eats and reproduces, um, and then you can have a viable vertebrate. Right? So one of the puzzles of vertebrate biology is how do you take common ancestors that we think were sessile filter feeders, and how do you get mobile forms? Okay? Because mobility is one of the cool hallmarks of the vertebrate lineage. All right, so let's take a look in a little more detail about how these larvae are actually working. And what I want to talk to you about here is an experiment that Matt and Henry did in the lab. So here's a close-up of one of these um, larvae. And I know I've been talking to some of you about helical climataxis. So I wanted to show you some data about what I was talking about here with helical climataxis. This is a name that's given to the fact that um, many organisms, particularly small organisms, will actually be able to orient up like a light gradient or a chemical gradient by swimming and rolling and turning in a corkscrew. So that's the helical part. The clinotaxis is they're going up a climb, all right, doing this, or down a climb. And so what Matt wanted to do is take a look at how they did this, describe the behavior very well. And so he had these larvae, he got them out of the ocean, he brought them into the lab, and he uh, turned that light on, and they were in their negatively phototactic stage, right? So they would swim away from 
the light source. And so he could map out in three-dimensional helical coordinates the axis of the helix. And one important thing to notice here is that these guys have a single eye spot. So if you ever hear about the Vart's challenge to Darwin, you know, what good is half an eye? Well, you only need one eye. Forget about half an eye. And it doesn't need to be an object-forming eye to do something useful. It just has to be essentially like a simple photoresistor. Okay? And so there's a single eye spot here. And what Matt did is he measured the intensity that was of the light that was hitting that eye spot. And what you can see is there's a sine wave here because what's happening is relative to the light, so imagine where I'm pointing is the light, right? This thing is rolling like this. So low light comes up high light, low light, high light. So that's just the, the rolling component of it. So that's what causes that motion there. And then in addition, he's measuring this thing called the trunk angle. And that's the angle here between this blobby head and the tail, right? And so what happens is these guys are sort of constantly wagging their tail and then that trunk angle, they'll turn. It's like a rudder on an outboard motor, if that means anything to you. We're in the land of lakes, aren't we here? We're only, what, you're never more than six miles away from a body of water. You should all know what a, oh, outboard motor is. Anyway, so you turn the outboard motor, it's always going, and that's how you steer, right? And so that's the trunk angle. And then he's got this thing, degrees per, this is in degrees per second, omega here, which is the rotational velocity. So how fast they're actually spinning. And so what he's going to do here at point A is he's going to turn on, right here at point A, he's going to turn on a light from the right-hand side. And what happens to this larva is then it, it goes through this really interesting thing where it actually turns towards the light, performs a very tight roll, and then comes back and now is spiraling away again. So this is its turning maneuver. And so he can show very clearly the kind of stimulus in the world that caused the change in motion of these guys and in this helical coordinate system. So after the light is introduced, there's a delay here between the introduction of the light source and the control variable, which is to change that trunk angle. Okay, to turn. So if you're, if you're swimming along like this, and then the light hits you, and now you, you turn that outboard motor a little more, and there's more of a curve, what's, what we're going to call beta here, that beta angle between your propulsive system and the rest of your body. So you can see there's a change in light intensity that comes before that change in the trunk angle. And what happens here, and I've said this to a couple of you offline, right? it's the omega here, the angular velocity, that's the control variable. And you can see there's a little peak in that, and that is the sole, solely responsible for that change there. It looks more complicated than that, but if you're in a helical coordinate system, that's all you need to affect that kind of change and turn in direction. So it's a really stripped down way to navigate in three dimensions relative to a stimulus. So it's a really cool little system here that Matt has figured out. And so um, in addition to that, he and uh, Jim Struther did a numerical simulation where they tested a number of different kinds of very simple models to think about how you might control this behavior. So here's beta, that trunk angle there. And they're saying the control of beta is the key to this whole process. There's a gain constant, and it doesn't get much simpler than this. The light intensity is proportional to that beta. This is one of a uh, couple models we tested, and it's the one that best fit in a behavioral match sense the data that they have. So you have this tail motion, and then they, they model the forces and moments, which then cause the change in heading. So that beta changes the tail motion, causes a changes a change in the, the rate, a uh, change in the heading that's measured by omega here. That changes the light perception, which again feeds back and changes beta. So those of you who are into sensory motor loops, here's a very, very simple one. And so what we want to do is, we, we're very excited about this, and uh, I know I've talked to a, a number of you who are thinking about going to the SICB meeting, the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology, which is a nice mid-sized meeting, about 900 posters. This year it's in January in Austin, Texas. Love that meeting. I remember standing by Matt when he was presenting this um, poster. And I just was like, let's build a robot. Right? This is so cool. You know, you figured this out. Now let's, let's see if it works in, 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 in the world of robotic modeling. So what's great about this is the simulation predicted a simple linear neural circuit. So that's what's really handy. Now, I'm, I'm abbreviating 
helical climate axis with HK, by the way. So it predicts this kind of simple circuit, and how are we going to instantiate the circuit? Um, the way we're going to do it is we built a kind of robot that we call TADREL, which is short for tadpole robot. And here's a dorsal view down low. Here's a lateral view here. It's a surface swimming robot. So we're going to simplify our life. Uh, Javon's group, you guys know that you know as soon as you try to go underwater, your life becomes incredibly complicated because stuff leaks. And when it leaks, you wreck electronics. Why doesn't somebody work on waterproof electronics? Wouldn't that be awesome? Then we wouldn't have to worry about all this waterproof. They're making flexible electronics now. Let's make waterproof electronics. Um, anyway, just a, just a wish for anybody listening. About when you get it done, let me know. I'll buy it. Okay, waterproof electronics. So what we have here is to avoid those problems of going underwater, we're adapting this system to see if it can work in two dimensions. So these are surface swimming robots. Um, essentially, this is a... Uh, a plex, not plexiglass, uh, rubber may, what do we call that? Tupperware, swing Tupperware. There's a servo motor here that's attached to a shaft, so here's our outboard motor. And it's flapping, in this case here, of Tadro 3, and you guys didn't hear about Tadro 3 yesterday, EEBB. This is a notochord, it doesn't have any vertebrae. And that biomimetic notochord has an E value, which is a bending modulus, and a length of tail, those together combined to form the structural stiffness of the tail. Both of these things, E and L, are going to be characters that we evolve a little bit later on, but we're not there yet. We're looking at just trying to build a system that the model of that behavior of the, the tackle one. We're, we built this initially as an analog um, robot, and then it's really funny. I, I love the analog stuff, you know, with resistors and things like that, because when you do something like we've done here, like you have a, a little computer, People always think there's some kind of magic that happens in a computer. You know, like, it's, it's a brain now. Brain control behavior. And so we built it as an analog system. Um, but then, you know, everybody's like, come on, we really got to put it in a computer, too. So what I'm talking about here is our computer version of it. And very simply, what the code was doing, and I'll show you the code because it's so simple here. We're taking the light intensity at a photoresistor, which we're calling an eye here, but it's just a very simple device that changes its resistance inversely in proportion, in proportion to the light intensity. Um, feeds into um, the input of an MIT handy board microcontroller, and we output from that light intensity then the turning angle, which is that beta. So here is our instantiation of that predicted circuit. And the way this looks in code, and so I know this is a code very, very code-friendly audience, so I figure you guys would be much more comfortable with code than uh, you know an RC circuit or something like that. So here is, um, here is the meat of what happens which is we take the sensor value and it's windowed. Okay, so the sensor value is coming in a sensor float. And then we just uh, uh, take that and convert it into beta, which is that tail angle, angle which causes our servo motor to, to change its direction. Okay, and we just have a separate motor that's sitting there flapping all the time. So sensory motor circuits, sensory input creates motor output. Okay, now what does this look like when we operate the system in two dimensions? Let me show you some trajectories from looking overhead at the system. On the left-hand side here, this whole column, three different trials of when there is no beta signal present. So these are control trials here. So here's a light that's shining above there. So remember, these guys are orienting towards light. And you can see we start, and it just goes around, do, 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 and it stops. Here, it's, it, it wiggles, it, it sort of does a path, but it's sort of by the light, but it doesn't stay by the light. Now we did these things we call spotlight, which is we turn it on, and then when this track goes from dark black to gray, that's when we've turned the light on. So it's milling around, milling around, turn the light on, and it goes, whoop, it goes to the light, change the handedness of that helix, and orbits in a different, in counterclockwise now, around that light source. So here are other trials, it's going do-do-do-do-do, here we go clockwise, we turn on the light, it goes along the wall, comes over to the light source here, changes the handedness of its helix, and then orbits in a counterclockwise manner. So that's repeatable there. We also did conditions where there was a very abrupt, we just kept the light on all the time, there was a very abrupt, um, this was like a horrible movie, but I love watching it, um, Chronicles of Riddick, remember we designed Crematorium? You know, you've got the shadow coming, and it's like you can't be in the sun. 
So here's our crematorium version, where here's a very harsh shadow over on this side. So we started the robot over here. It's milling around. As soon as it hits the hot sun equivalent, it shoots over to the other side of the pool, and then it's gone back and forth by the light source. You see that over here, too. So what you can see is we're replicating that behavior, being sensitive to the light. We can see, and I'm not going to show you the data, it changes the omega in a way that we predict uh, from the circuit. So we say, all right, this is a pretty good behavioral match. We think we have the physiological mechanism as well. And we've got captured some of the structural properties of the robot in the shape and the way that the tail works with this vertebrate post anal tail, right, that's got another cord that's actually propulsive. So that's CAD row 3. And what we wanted to do next is use this system to test some evolutionary ideas. And so here's where I'm just going to reference some of the conversations that came up at the end of the talk yesterday. So when we do physically embodied robots, we work with very small population sizes. We do that in part because we have to build these structures all the time. And we, um, <laughs> we have a finite amount of time to do things. So that said, the, the points that folks were making yesterday about genetic drift or a lot of chance in our system are absolutely true. It's in there. So part of what I've done today is to try to talk about the magnitude of the chance versus the magnitude of our selection forces. You're still going to see systems, because the population sizes are small, and I'm talking about when we're evolving these guys, a population size of three, okay, sort of ridiculously small if you think about the math of small numbers. So the system is going to be not completely swamped by chance, but dominated in this first sense. And so one of our tasks is, can we pull out, can we find the signal of selection, given that we're imposing selection on our system? Okay, so that's a piece of what I'm going to be trying to address here for you guys. So here's a shot of our Tadro 3s that are taking off. There's a light source down here, and they're engaging in a, a competition with each other to do what? To find, to go towards the light. So pretend for a second that what we're really doing here, since light is life in biology, what they're doing is competing for a food source. Okay, a simple navigational task using the helical pinotaxis. Uh, system that we've talked about here. And we were, um, with some initial trials, uh, we would see things like this. So this is looking down at the pool, and sorry, these different gray levels, I hope, I hope they can be seen on broadcast here. So here's our third place tadpole, and I'll talk to you about how we actually judge the placing. But you can see it's got a big, big wide orbit. There's the first place tad row. It's got a tighter orbit here, okay, around the light target. But all of them are orbiting here. And how are we judging them? Um, well, our guess was, first of all, what I didn't tell you here, is these different tad rows have tails of different stiffnesses. And at least initially when we were running this, there was a very clear uh, discrimination between performance and the stiffness of the tail. The stiffer tails were actually doing better. So we had a prediction then that selection for improved speeding will evolve stiff, stiffer tails. And, and now I'm going to formalize what I mean by stiffness here. So this is good old spring stiffness from your introductory physics class where you have a cantilevered system and stiffness is equal to, there's a constant that's not in here, don't worry about it for those of you who actually remember there's supposed to be a three here somewhere. Okay. Um, this is flexural stiffness up top, EI, so here's that bending modulus and I is a shape parameter that we're not going to vary that talks about the distribution and cross section of the shape. So this is a, in meters to the fourth power, so it's a double integration of the distribution of the area. That flexural stiffness is divided by the length squared of your cantilever beam, okay, for structural stiffness. So you can see, if we're evolving E and L, that L is potentially going to have, because of that cube term, a much greater effect on the structural stiffness than E. But we're coding both of these as quantitative characters and allowing them to evolve in our system. So what are we using for our fitness function? The relative fitness in any generation rewards increased speed relative to others in the population, um, reduced wobble of the body. So these guys, as you know, most things when they swim, and I know you guys who work on the fish, right? We're talking about this. When your fish swim, right, they, they sit there and they wiggle a little bit. Depending on who you talk to, that's seen either as inefficient recoil, from the tail, right? You want it to be able to be straight. Or, by other people, it's seen as, depending on how the body's changing, the 
fish is actually working itself as a wiggling wing. Okay? Um, but we said, you know what? Probably these guys, they're not wing-like, right? They're a, if you want to get, if you know anything about lifting theory, maybe you could say they're a, a Flettner rotor. Those are the, you know, you can spin a cylinder and it can actually, in a crosswind, can act as a sail. It's one of those, like, you see it show up in, believe it or not, stories about this vessel sailed across the Atlantic Ocean and has spinning cylinders. So it's used all the time in basic hydrodynamic theory to talk about that. So we don't think these were lifting bodies. So we thought, you know what? Wobbling as you swim is probably inefficient, right? It's, it's rotational inertia that you don't need. So that gives a negative sign here. And distance to the food. If that light source is supposed to be food, you know, it's bad to not be by the food relative to other individuals. Problem being, and this is a nice trade-off, thinking of trade-offs here, if you're swimming all the time, how are you going to stay next to the food? So you're going to have to be able to do these tight orbits we talked about. And then the time shift. How, how quickly does it take to get into the vicinity? So you may be very fast, but maybe you're inaccurate in terms of your navigational task. So these are the factors that went into our relative fitness function. It's at this point that I want to talk to you just um, a bit about um, uh, this, this paper that I don't think many people have seen from uh, 1995. Um, you're all supposed to smile now. You're all supposed to have read this, right? It's like this new, what I think of as the seminal um, experimental evolution paper with the E. coli um, out of Michigan State, Lenski's lab. And um, what I loved about this paper was the partitioning of, of evolutionary change into sort of in, into these three um, elements: adaptation, chance, and history. And so. If we think about a morphospace space where we have a phenotype, one phenotype, and another phenotype, and we think about this spot here representing the mean of the population in this biphenotypic space, we can talk about the evolutionary change being the movement of that population mean in that space. Now, I could be getting it wrong, all right? So forgive me if I'm getting it wrong. But the way I interpret thinking about this is that that vector, we can think about this as a vector here, and that vector can be decomposed into two elements. There's a component of that that is selection, and selection is what causes adaptation. So that's the relationship there. And then there's another element that is chance. So you can see selection is trying to push the population in one direction, and chance is deflecting that selection. So that's the interaction of those chance. The chance, by the way, includes everything from mutation, drift, random mating. All right, so that's how um, I'm going to be talking about the different forces that are acting to cause that evolutionary change. And, and there are ways that we can actually measure the strength of selection. And that was something controversial that came up yesterday, and we'll talk about that again in just a minute. The history effect, by the way, from here would be if you start the population off in a different area, right, when you do all those wonderful replications that Travisano and colleagues were able to do, you may find different conditions because, in fact, the fitness landscape that may exist in this morpho space could be different depending on where you start. For those of you modeling, it's a change in starting conditions, right? So you can, you can imagine a case, for example, <coughs> this is something that we, we do see in our robotic systems where all of that evolutionary change is accounted for by chance. There are times when we don't see any selection at all, and I'll explain how that happens. Okay? So that's the historical difference that we talk about there. Um, this is in the general context of how do you talk about um, modeling evolution, and there are different ways to do it. Um, one, um, one way to do it that when we're talking about our robots that we like to think about actually comes from Robert Brandon's work on the, the philosophy of evolutionary theory. And he talks about you need to have these six components in any complete study of evolution. And for us, when we do our robotic modeling, the outcome of our experiments is the function of whatever is evolving, or the changing function in an ecological situation. And then, what is the response of the population to selection in that environment? And what's in black here, the genetics, the polarity of the traits, population structure, and the selection environment are what we set as investigators. Okay, so we allow these other things to change and we measure as a response to what we're doing. So this is, gives us what we call our robotic, biorobotic life cycle. 
where anywhere you happen to start to <coughs> start with manufacturing new robots. We put them in competition, like the picture you saw. We, we uh, have a selection operator, which is just judging their performance relative to each other at any generation. This all happens in hardware, so these are the phenotypes. In genotypes and software, we have a mutation operator, gametogenesis, and a mating algorithm that gives us the genomes to produce the new generation of these robots. And I should say, by the way, and, and it's kind of a, I think it's kind of a given in this audience, but just in case, the robots we're talking about are fully autonomous. We've been talking about autonomous behavior. They're not remote controlled, right? They're not like the battle bot things where people are remote controlling and the buzz saw comes down and this sort of thing, right? These are taking sensory input, this very simple navigational primitive that we described, taking a sensory input through one eye, in the case of category of three, coming with, uh, with one degree of freedom, change in the beta, that tail angle, and having this orientation behavior that we, we've now talked about. All right, so let's take a look at uh, what we found with the Tableau 3 system here. So we've got generation on the x-axis. We've got two different things, and let me explain them in, in turn. Um, up top, I have feeding behavior of the Tableau. This is a composite function using some Z scores to standardize for the different scales here. This is a composite function of all the four elements that go into the fitness function. We're comparing them over the entire range of generations, so this should be related to fitness over time if fitness were actually increasing. So there's an average value here that I've just called zero. And better than average over time would be above that line and worse than average would be below it. So these points here represent the mean of the population. You can see it's all over the place. You're, I know some of you are crying drift right now and you're right. Okay? Well, let's talk about this in a second. So we expect it by our simple prediction this kind of a linear model, right, that if selection for tails were important, we would get an increase in the population um, here. So I've connected these up. Um, they really shouldn't be connected up, but there's a reason I'm doing that, and I'll explain why I threw that polynomial in there in a, in a little bit. Down below, we have the K, the structural stiffness of the axial skeleton, and how is it evolving? So again, we expected there to be, by selecting for enhanced feeding, we expected the stiffness of the tail to increase. Well, part of the problem may be the feeding actually isn't getting any better of the population as a whole. <laughs> if we look at the overall trend, and we see initially what looks like an increase maybe in the structural stiffness of the tail, but then there's a very clear downturn here. So we ought to say, given the caveat of um, the drift problem here, or the chance problem, and, the, and its magnitude, the first reaction might be, hey, we disproved our hypothesis. Simple feeding alone doesn't explain something like the evolution of the stiffness of the tail. Okay? Or you might, be, you might be tempted to say, hey, as that tail gets more flexible, what we're actually finding is the opposite. Right? That flexible tails in this situation are actually more adaptive for feeding uh, than non-flexible tails. But we have the problem, right? which is the feeding isn't actually changing. So let, let's think about what might be going on here. I have outlined... When I told you we actually knew, we know enough about the system because we can look under the hood of when selection is actually happening. It turns out that it's only happening uh, in four of these generations. So this is when, by definition, when we have differential reproduction. Okay, so we have these three individuals, and when they differ enough in performance uh, to put different numbers, we had a simple algorithm of how many uh, haploid gametes you get to put into the gene pool, right? So we only had selection there. So if this system is working, right, what should be happening, if we're actually selecting for behavior, and oh my gosh, if we aren't, it should be that this selection means right here, from going from generation one to two, should evolve a population with better feeding. Phew, it did. Okay, what about this? Generation five to six. Uh-oh, there's a problem there. How about generation six to seven? Eh, maybe there's a little bit. Uh, this is weird that's going on, that we're selecting, but we're not seeing a change here. This is really swamped by chance, would be an idea, right in here in the middle. What about selection at generation nine? Here we are, that population is increasing. So really only in two of those four cases is there a clear signal looking at these data that what we think we're actually selecting for is, is actually changing. Okay, so this is why this shows you here the sort of balance we have between the chance and the adaptive effects. But we weren't satisfied with this. We wanted to understand a little bit more about what's happening. Yeah? One of the earbuds? 
uh, there's uh, standard deviations. And so uh, just taking a look at the genes that I mentioned, so the proportion of the genes that are possible here for E and L, so this is a relative scale. So here's the, L, the number of L genes, and we wanted to see what was going on. And I mentioned how sensitive this one was to L, so you can really see, so generation, just to remind you, so selection at generation 9, that was a big change in L. So as L grows, stiffness is going to decrease. So that's clearly, you know, it should be connected to the genes, what's happening with the stiffness, and it is. That's all that that picture is showing you um, there. And just a reminder of where the selection was happening. Um, we thought, well, gosh, maybe we should map this out, what's happening in morphospace with stiffness overlay. Yeah, I, I might have missed this, but how is it that you're encoding E and L in the genome if that's a physical property of the, the you know, the robotic notochord? Yeah, we're literally just taking the value for those and treating it as a quantitative trait. So if E has, if E, uh, so if this is 10 millimeters long, we have a diploid genome, and so there's, if you're making a 10 millimeter long tail, five millimeters is on, on, on one of your chromosomes, uh, one allele, and five, uh, five is on the other there. So that's how we get our diploid compound there. And so that informs very very how you build the robot? Pardon? So that informs how you build the Absolutely. robot? Absolutely. Right. So, so it's a very, very simple mapping. This evolves in software, and then it tells you how to build the robot in the next generation. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Very simple genetic algorithm. Um, Okay, so when we take a look at this population in, here's now, this is E and L, morphospace here. Um, what I've done here is, in terms of these standard deviations, created sort of a footprint of the population for you to look at here. So here's that change when we went from generation 9 to generation 10. There's a big, the vector is of high magnitude. It's not changing much in terms of the bending stiffness phenotype. It's changing a lot in terms of the tail length. I've overlaid here in these isoclines. K here, this is the 10. Um, it's newtons per meter isocline. Here's the 8 newtons per meter isocline. And you can see here's 4. You can't quite see 2. And remember, we expected this to be hill climbing up the stiffness slope. And it's actually, overall, there's some driving around, which has to do with the chance um, and some other things we think is going on. So here's one to two, it's actually getting stiffer. Three to four, it's going downhill. It goes uphill right here, then back down, and back, back down again. Okay? So, what's going on here? Um, what we wanted to do is think about the four things that we were measuring as part of our fitness function. So we have that speed, wobble, distance to the food, and time to the food. And this is what's happening in each intergenerational change. Here was the result, right, of whether it went, it increased, the speed increased, or the speed decreased. And what's in gray here is these are the generational changes where selection was actually present. So here's what's happening with the feeding behavior. So actually this was, I said this was negative, it's actually a slightly positive change there, but it's negligible. But you can see in three of the four cases of selection, we have the feeding behavior actually getting better. Stiffness increases in only two, the first two of those. So what is going on here? Well, we have an expected pattern when selection is present. What we had predicted is that when the stiffness of the notochord, when, when feeding behavior increased, stiffness of the notochord would increase, and this would be the relationship of the variables and the behaviors that we were rewarding for fitness. Here's what we actually found, and you can see that pattern here. We have an increase in the wobble in all those cases. So we were wrong, right? I said, you know, you can think about wobble in a couple of different ways. We were thinking of it as an inefficiency here, when clearly there's either a correlation between wobble and something else, or we're just misunderstanding it. So we ran some simulations, and we actually looked at data in the lab as well. So here's, here's that angular velocity, that thing that's really important for the helical climate axis. If you just have your, your critter swimming, it's just, you know, there's a little bit of wobble. Right? It's wiggling back and forth there. If you add in a maneuver here, that maneuver, right? these guys maneuver, remember, if you think about it as helical climb taxes, they're maneuvering by turning. right? So you get big wobbles like this when you actually have high maneuverability. So in fact, what the wobbles were, we screwed up. right? Wobbles are actually, we should have called it agility or something like that, and we should have rewarded enhanced agility because you want to be able to be really agile to hang around the light source. Well, 
we didn't do, we didn't recognize what was going on until after we'd done our ten generations of evolution. So we couldn't go back and sort of redo just the numbers, right? Because you changed the population based on the selection that was going on. But we could say, well, what happens then when we take if we let's recalculate this sort of absolute fitness value, this feeding behavior, and what happens when we say wobble is good? So here's the old now in gray, wobble is bad. And you can see why I put these um, polynomial lines in here now. Look at that. Wobble is now, we've got much greater change in behavior here with this selection at the first generation. So that's a larger magnitude change. What happens here from 5 to 6? Under the new system, we have a positive change. 6 to 7, positive change. 9 to 10, positive change. So that at least was something that we thought was consistent with what we should be doing, which is selecting on behavior, and behavior ought to be related in somehow to that, that selection. Okay? So, wobble is good, wobble is not bad. It doesn't change anything about this pattern, as I mentioned. Now, one of the things we try to do, because this takes a lot of time to do actual evolution of robots, is our collaborators, Chung Wai and Rob Root, who work at uh, Lafayette College, um, We'll do something near and dear to a couple of your hearts, which is, I know you guys are using Light, uh, light Hill's Elongated Body Theory, right? Wasn't it? Yeah. What are you going to have? And then Tony, if Tony's somewhere, Tony's there, Elongated Body Theory, which is a hydrodynamic theory out there. So we used hydrodynamic theory to do a digital TADRA, okay? So I know, strictly speaking, in the world of Barbara Webb, we're no longer doing biorobotics, okay? Because it's no longer physically embodied. Oh well, we wanted hundreds of generations, and oh my gosh, what's our, our result here? So we have our virtual tank, and in fact here are the paths of three tad rows. And as you can see, they're, they're sort of spir spiraling around. They are not, the, the tortuosity, the curvature of their CHK is actually tighter in these digital tad rows. But they're able to navigate, and they end up circling around the light. So the behavior we're, we're able to uh, simulate here with our physics engine in our world. And what we found, and these are just two examples of it, but I mean, you can see we can do, of course, the beauty of digital simulation. You can do buttloads of generations. We kept it to a uh, population size of three, though, so we could have these small um, mathematics of small number effects in there. So we're doing that as well. And no matter where we started, whatever tail stiffness we started the population at, it would come down over a couple hundred generations and end at a Okay, what we were guessing is maybe an optimal tail stiffness of somewhere that's intermediate in the possible tail stiffnesses here. So this is a different result right, than what we were getting, but maybe we had one case where the tail stiffness was actually higher in the one run that we did with the tad rows, and it was coming down to some optimal that balanced maneuverability with speed. Okay, so that's our guess based on uh, what's happening here. Um, now, there are... So my mathematician friend, Rob Root, of course, was um, saying, you know, John, we've got to make the population size bigger. Absolutely, you know, uh, small population sizes are a problem because the strength of selection is not very high. So while we're doing that, let's actually, actually put in some backbones into our axial skeleton. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about, um, the system I mentioned uh, last night, uh, yesterday afternoon, at the EEBB -E -E session, and that's TAD row 4. So this is now not thinking about the ancestor of vertebrates, but early jawless vertebrates, where we see experiments in the bones that were there. So instead of a continuous backbone, we now actually see little bony elements in these early vertebrates that are about 400 million years old, as opposed to 500 million years old. So this is a fossil fish, Drepanaspis. Here's a static model of Drepanaspis. And here is our robotic model, which is CAD row 4. Here's our handyboard in here. It now has two eyes, because vertebrates have two eyes. It's now got a lateral line equivalent, which is an IR emitter detector system, and it's got a tail now that can have variable number of vertebrae. So we do our cartoon of this. There's, a, again, a sort of rigid body, a propulsive tail, a biomimetic tail with variable numbers of centra. We also vary the tail span here, if we take the tail off and look at it, so we can we kept this column of constant length, and we evolved the number of joints by evolving, or the size of the joints by evolving the number of vertebrae in here. We evolved the caudal fin 
um, that's going in here. So we have the B, the span of the caudal fin, and the number of the vertebrae. And then these IR proximity detectors that are acting as our uh, predator detectors, we can evolve the threshold of that predator detection. This is based on a system that we find in the neurobiology of fish. It's a two-layer subsumption hierarchy where if a predator is detected, that overrides the foraging behavior of that robot. So we use living fish as our analog of how that neurobiology works. It turns out that neurobiology is highly conserved in vertebrates when you do the phylogenetic reconstruction, so it's probably not a bad guess for a bunch of um, early vertebrates as well. Let me talk to you next about the genetics of our system. So we have a population size of six. We doubled the population size. Think about these colors here representing your, you know, something about your various character states there. We have diploid parents. These are three quantitative traits with three chromosomes, so we're not worrying. We have independent assortment. There's no recombination. We have mutation and random mating. And selection, we're going to pick the top three. These are our, 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 our reproductives. So the top one gets uh, six, then four, then two gametes in the net population. So if we carry through the color coding, you can see our gold medal winner in the Olympics of life gets to make six gametes. The differences in the hewing here represents the change by mutation of what's going on. Here in purple is changing in the, uh, uh, the hewing of the color, also representing mutation and so forth. These are our gene pool. Can I love, sorry, this may bother some of you. I like to think of this as a gamete bucket or maybe a cocktail, gamete cocktail. You shake it up and you, you randomly now mix these guys together and you get the pairings here for your diploid offspring. So that is in graphical format what we're doing for randomized mating. And this gives us the instructions to make the tails, set the IR detectors here for the different robots in our next population. The predator in this system is not evolving. This is the prey that are evolving. So Tadro 4 here is a prey. So here's a picture of Tadro 4 being chased by, um, I didn't tell you this yesterday, but I'll tell you today in the world of robot names, right? So this is Tadro, so we call it prey row. Isn't that creative? What do we call the predator then for being equally creative about robot names? Anybody? Predro, no. Predro, no. Pardon? No. Randy, you got an idea back there? Robot name? For the predator? Eric. Eric. How about this? Tadiator. <laughs> That's pretty good. So we have Tadiator, who is using an IR detection system, and his only job is to behave like a visual predator to go after our tad row prey. Um, and let me show you a video, which I didn't show you yesterday, but I'll show you now. What you're going to see here, this is Tadiator. Here's our light source. Here's prey row. What's going to happen, and they've got, a, they've got lights on, so there's a green light so you can tell their bow, the front end, and a red light for the back end. So you're going to see in the dark here, you're going to see uh, the Tadro come towards the light. Meanwhile, the, the Tadiator is going to be coming around searching, and somewhere right around here it's going to bypass the prey route, and it's going to take a sharp turn, come up into the blind spot of the, predator, of the prey, and nail it from behind. Now we do a three-minute trial, so part of what we're doing is rewarding the prey robot for staying away from the predator. For detecting the predator and initiating an escape, you'll see it initiates an escape, but it's way too late. For staying close to the light source, for having a high speed but also high rate of acceleration. So it's carrying an accelerometer on it. So let's see what that looks like here. And it's down sampled to one frame per second. And so right now, Teddy Eater's like, doo doo doo, I don't see it, I don't see it. Oh, it's just here, it's going to turn here. Meanwhile, Prey Row is going right to the food. It has not elicited an escape response, so it is focused on eating. And you can see Tadiator down his turn, coming in for an approach. It's chasing on the other side of the light. So you're going to see that Prey Row still hasn't detected it. And at the last moment, Prey Row is going to be too late. Right there, it starts to initiate an escape, and the Predator got it. So they're going to continue this chase for a while after this. So in this selection and action, so we can run a bunch of trials here. These are the pathways that we use to measure the metrics that we're going to use for the fitness function. And as I mentioned, the rewarding foraging, 
and the distance from the light, average velocity. We use, in this case, a compound z-score to normalize within a generation what's happening for our relative fitness function. And I know we're running out of time here, and so I just want to very quickly get to um, some of these issues with the strength of chance versus the strength of selection. So this is just a graphic to let you know what we were trying to do with evolving three traits at a time here. So each, you know, what, what, this is just a reminder, right, that when you select on the phenotype of a population, you can move the mean, right, that's directional selection. You can change the variance, that's either stabilizing or disruptive selection. So mean and variance can evolve, and in point of fact, so can the covariance. The mean and uh, the variance and the covariance, which are represented here by these relationships, um, can be represented by, um, in population genetics, what's called a gene matrix. And so because we have a heritability of one, whatever's happening phenotypically is exactly, and I think this is to your point about the coding, whatever's happening phenotypically is exactly represented in the genome. And so this is the equation that drew the ire of somebody with a beard last night. Um, and, and this is called the breeder's equation, and it's, it's sort of a staple in population genetics, where the response of a population is equal to the narrow sense heritability times the strength of selection. And so that response and can be the difference between the offspring and the parents' generations. The selection strength is the difference between the parents and the population. So I, I think part of the problem, although I'd love to hear more about this in just a minute, um, was the concern that this is too simplistic a way to measure selection. But it's how we're defining it here, so let's just carry forward for a moment. Um, and this is just to remind you guys of narrow sense heritability, which is the ratio of the additive genetic variance to the phenotypic variance, which is one here. The point is, you have to have variance in order to respond to selection. And that's just a really essential piece that you all know because you're all amazing evolutionary biologists, but it's worth um, reminding ourselves what's going on here. And I'm introducing for, this is what I was doing last night in calculations, this thing I'm calling the strength of chance, which is meant to be the response minus the strength of selection. So it's describing those two components of the vector. So we can measure and compare the relative strength of the chance element to the relative strength of selection in this population. And so just showing you what's going on with our G matrix, so this is over generational time here. So what we see happening, and this is, this is actually something that we see. So remember I'm asking, what are the evidence that we have that selection is actually working in this population? And so because we've got chance still that is of high magnitude, we're looking for selection signals in a variety of ways. Wait, one signal of selection is a decrease in the total variance of the population. Selection acts on that variance, right? So this is one indirect piece of evidence that we're applying selection to that population. If we look at the variance proportion that's on the first eigenvector of that G matrix, right, what we can see is something really interesting going on. That first of all, the, the N, the number of vertebrae, isn't loading onto that first axis at all. So that first eigenvector is explained by zeta, which is the predator detection threshold, and the tailspan B. Okay? And they're in this orientation. So the x-axis of these vectors that I'm showing you relate to B. So if it's pointing like this, all the variance there is um, loaded onto the tailspan. And if it's standing up here, all the variance is loaded onto the um, zeta. And what you can see here is a very regular pattern of what happens with the rotation of that eigenvector at each generation. Okay, it starts at 91, where 91 degrees, and that vector goes down here to 3 degrees. And so what I am suggesting, and maybe you have a better idea, is that um, what's happening is the target of selection here is switching from zeta here. It's now switching to beta. So as it eats up the variance in zeta, we now are turning to eating up the variance in beta. There's a very, this red arrow is mean there's a really abrupt switch right, right here. And then this now works its way back around again. So in terms of, I haven't run a model uh, on the eigenvectors here without selection operating. So I can't actually tell you what this would look like if this were purely due to chance. But in terms of looking for regularities in the world, we don't expect um, random processes to do this kind of regular 
uh, pattern engine. Not that it can't, right? Particularly with small numbers, it can. But this is one other potential uh, signal here for selection. Now, I'm going to use this again in just a second, and I'm going to correlate it to what's going on with the actual evolution. So this is, this is something, population's original footprint, um, where yesterday you folks were saying, you know, this is drift, John, come on. Um, this is not selection. And I said, well, look, in the gray dots, quite strength of selection. You know, here's negative selection, it's dropping, and got positive selection there. So what I did in terms of crunching some new numbers is I went back and I calculated the strength of chance. And what's really interesting here, so thank you for your comments yesterday, is in some cases we find chance to be almost equal and opposite to the strength of selection. So they really cancel out, right? So that helps explain why there's very little change in the mean. In other cases where we see the biggest increases, of course, where you have chance and strength of selection both being negative in this case, okay? And in some cases, chance, the strength of chance can be very low, in which case we do have selection operating. Uh, as long as there's variance here to operate. So this would be another piece of evidence I would offer that would allow us to partition the strength and chance in the, sorry, the selection and the chance elements. Let's take a look here at what's going on. What you can see when, so remember, so this is beta. So this is, if we're horizontal, we're switching to beta. So we would expect, based on this model, selection to be happening in here. Here's these positive selection values that are happening in here. So there's a rough correspondence between our vector orientation there. Let's take a peek now at uh, zeta. And here we've got something really interesting where that, again, it's very clear eating up of that variance. And so if we look at here where, this is where I'm saying, so now we've got, if you want to think about it as um, stabilizing selection where you eat up the, you narrow the shoulders of your bell curve there, that's why, I'm, I'm contending, that's why that's switching there. There's nothing to select here on zeta. So the target of selection can go to beta there, and you can actually see strength of selection is very low. Because you can't have strength of selection, right? You can't select if there's nothing to select from. Likewise, the chance values are very low here, and then those pick up as well. So I'm not arguing based on these data that selection is strong here. I'm saying there's times there's selection that's present, and we're detecting it in a slightly different way than we did with the Tadrow 4 system. So here's the number of vertebrae. You can see here, uh, this pattern here that I was saying, oh, yesterday I was saying, oh, this is directional selection and their stability was well, obviously much more complicated than that that's going on here. Right? We've got a lot of magnitude of chance in some cases that counterbalancing this strength of selection here. Um, also, um, I mentioned yesterday, I didn't show you the data, so I've got the data now, that we can just run controls without any selection at all. So these are three trials of controls to show you the patterns that happen in each of our characters here. And one of the things, um, you know, I have not compared these statistically to, to these patterns here, but one of the patterns that I think I see is that some of the changes that we see in the selection realm here, um, in terms of variance and the abruptness here, if you want to talk about a change in slope or an acceleration of the system, that we see higher accelerations in a system that's under selection than in a system that ha just has chance of element operating. I haven't tested that statistically, but that's an attempt to think about that. Um, evolution in morpho space, here's uh, some of these diagrams now that show you, here's where selection is trying to go, it's being deviated in its natural path by the chance effects. Again, just showing the relative, in some cases, about equal magnitudes of the selection and the chance effects. Something else that's worth pointing out in the criticism of this study is of the possible morpho space, at least in this two-dimensional view, we're only sampling a small part of that over these 10 generations. So that's, of course, why you want to do many more generations than are possible. And then the final thing, as I mentioned yesterday during the Q&A, is that we had run the, this uh, test twice. I don't show the first run because, in fact, um, it embarrasses a student who just got her PhD at, at Stanford, but now that she's got her PhD, I'll tell you her name. Kira Irving, in case you're listening somewhere, drop the robots in the water and flooded them. So, you know, it's not the kind of thing where you go, oh, let's just buy some more motors and pretend nothing happened. Right? You really have to rewind the tape and start. So we started exactly over again. And you can see here from number of vertebrae, we got the same pattern. I didn't run the strength of selection here to test that out. Um, here's this question about optimal tail stiffness that we saw in the tab of three generations. What's really interesting, and this was not the case in the, the tail span, so I, I just left it off here, that zeta, the predator detection threshold, 
Initially, we got the same pattern as well in our first two runs with the tapering off. And what was really interesting is if you run a correlation of zeta with n here, at least in the first five generations, there's a high correlation coefficient. Same thing down here. We see a high correlation coefficient first five generations <laughs> with what's happening up here and, and a low correlation coefficient afterwards. So in terms of looking for regularities in the data that we wouldn't necessarily think are related to chance, um, those are some signals that are in there. So I want to skip the change in behavior stuff and uh, just remind you that this is all attempt to test these ideas about selection. And I want to thank the students who are in my lab for the many hours that they spent working with these physically embodied robots and drove them into the world of simulation. So thank you very much. single sensor, you're not taking snapshots to, to detect an error like you would if you have two eyes because you know you try to know the difference between your two sensors. With a single sensor you actually have to do sort of the equivalent of kind of spatial integration. Right? You have to wait until you move your body in the right position. That it would be another eye, but that's not how you're doing that calculation. Yes? So uh, you mentioned that uh, about calculating strength of selection. Have yeah. you just tried calculating selection coefficients just based on the relative fitness? On the relative one? Fitnesses? I mean, you have, you have numbers for the relative fitness. I seem to remember you mentioned something about that yesterday. Yeah, you know, so the, that absolute behavior thing might be seen as a kind of relative fitness value. So, no, I, I haven't done that to do the selection coefficients. No. Okay. I'll do that. No. You will? Yeah. Okay. And I will will you help me? I've never calculated Absolutely. Partial coefficient. If you give are, those the, are those partial coefficients? Is that what they are? Like a partial um, regression? No, no, no. It's much easier. Uh, oh. I'll, I'll show you. Okay. So what was the, the motivation you had thinking that the, the smaller stiffness would make the thickness better? So we originally predicted that stiffer tails would lead to faster things because and that gets down to the biomechanics of tails, which I didn't talk about today. But, um, you know, things vibrate faster if they're stiffer is the quick mechanical answer there. Um, and then when we saw the results, you know, yeah. it's a tendency to want to pile on the adaptation explanations, right? Oh, well, it's not chance that did this. It must be, we, we must be thinking about this wrong. And that our guess was that with a more flexible tail, you actually can do this thing of getting to the light source and then you have much better maneuverability of hanging around the light source because you can turn better because you can actually curve your whole body. Now we have tested that by going back and looking at our videos of the trials to actually measure the fact that, to, to see if that's actually the case. We do know, because we did test, that there is a relationship, a positive relationship between swimming speed and maneuverability as it's measured by the wobble which makes sense if you've ever tried to do something like, um, uh, what's a good example? Um, maybe back to motorboats again. You know, you have to have a head of steam, right? If you're going to make one of those cool acrobatic turns, you need to have some velocity to it. So there's a, a positive feedback between that inertia and powering that active, actively assisted turn that we think we're picking up with the big walls. Um, yes? How does mutation work in this system? I would imagine that you, given six robots that you know, a, a no mutation doesn't work for your study, no. right? <laughs> yeah, so what we were doing is we were just taking um, in the genome, so let's say back to the like, tail length. So if the tail was 
10 millimeters. And so we got 5 millimeters on one chromosome and 5 millimeters on the sister chromosome. Um, what we would do is we would, we would say there's a Poisson distribution. So that's, that's our mutation function. And so most of the time, it's most probable there's not going to be much mutation. But there is probability, if we look at the outliers there, so we had a lookup table and we just said, okay, we roll the die every time and say, what is, is, what's the magnitude, where are we on our lookup table in terms of the density of the probability? So, but it could, so it could step in one direction with some probability or, or could, yes. it, could it only get one unit longer or could it randomly jump from 10 to 4 millimeters or something like that? So it, it, there could be larger jumps, but they were lower probability. Okay. How often did you see that in 10 generations with six robots? Um, so if we go back here to, um, I think the answer is looking at that, um, for example, the strength. I, I, I don't have mutation pulled out here, um, right? But when I look at, for example, I guess another way of stating that is how often is chance explained by mutation versus sampling error? Yeah, or, you know, so I, I, you know, I, I have mutation in my data, so I know what the magnitude of that is. I, I haven't partitioned it into the different parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be something you'd be interested in seeing. Yeah. Knowing about. Okay. Are there any questions at the uh, remote sites? Any remote questions? <laughs> okay, I guess uh, since we're running... Oh, is there another question? Last one? Okay. Yeah. Well, once asked, I was ask a two and a half question, actually. Uh, uh, <laughs> two and a half question. Is your robot, was that built as a vertebrate one or a nose cord one or something? Totally different than those other. Yeah, we you know we built it as a, roughly as a vertebrate, um, but it had a it had a notochord to it. And, and um, one of the one of the things that is you do when you're building these systems, and then you forget that you did, is you build them so they work, right? So you tinker around because the predator can't be too good, right? Or it's just like everybody gets swamped. The predator can't be wimpy. Well, there's no selection going on, so there's a sort of tuning of these things. So the tail that we built for the Predator was a tail that was kind of intermediate in speed, but you saw it could kind of catch up to the uh, caddy. Right. Next question. Curiosity. Um, for the prey robot, you gave it two eyes. Were those still both exclusively light receptors? Yeah. Okay, then I won't be asking a bit much here, but can you explain the IR detector as an analogy to the lateral line system then? Sure. So, what do you know about lateral lines? A little bit. They're not fish. They're not, they're not okay. They're like an inside. I like to think of them if you know about the hair cells that are in your inner ear. It's like an inside-out hair cell, which is uh, inside-out inner ear, which is really cool because evolutionarily they came first. So maybe what we've done is we've wrapped up in our cochlea things like that, the ocean, in our head. Isn't that cool? I love evolutionary biology. Anyway, so we've got this ear on the outside of the fish. Sometimes they're naked neuromasks, little teeny hairs that can detect changes in flow, sometimes those hairs are in a, a pressure detection system. What we know, for example, is that fish can school um, blind. They can school at night. So they can detect changes in the flow structure there. So that's a passive system. With an IR emitter detector, we're cheating by sending out an IR beam and looking for the reflection of it. But it gives us this proximity in the way that fish are able to, in a much more complicated way, detect proximity of near and far field sources. I guess we'll both move out that was what was determining the blind spot in there? So because I'm assuming that was just the blind spot in the lateral line. Yeah, they have a body. You know? And so this is where the morphology matters. If we you know, you could think about sort of putting an array of these IR detectors on them if you want to. But fish have variable kinds of lateral lines. Some fish some fish actually have no lateral line, most of them do. Some have them just on the head, some have them on the body, some extend all the way down. So that would be another way to think about evolving the sensitivity rather than predator detection threshold, evolving where those are positioned on the line. All right. Thank you very much.